Joseph Conrad was born December 3, 1857. He is regarded as one of the greatest English novelists, even though it was not his native language. After a failed suicide attempt, he began a life at sea. He worked in both the French and British merchant navies. He wrote The Heart of Darkness after visiting Central Africa, A Childhood Dream, in 1889. It was first published in 1902. Heart of Darkness begins aboard the cruising yawl Nelly. The ship is sailing down the Thames River near Gravesend and has to drop anchor until a flood passes. The captain of the boat is Charlie Marlow. He begins talking to his crew about how it must have been to be the first captain exploring pre-civilized England, captaining a trireme along the Forest Line River. This reminds him of his time in Africa, which he tells to the crew. It begins when he was a boy, studying maps of Africa. He wanted to visit the unknown places in the heart of it. Later, he sees a much more complete map and realizes that they must use ships to trade along the rivers and decides he must try to gain charge of one of the ships. Marlowe's aunt has a friend whose husband is high in the administration and she is willing to fuss until he gets the job. After he is given the chance to captain on one of the vessels, he learns of the fate of the previous captain, a Dane named Friesleven. It turns out that Friesleven thought he had been shorted in a trade and returned to the village where he began beating the chief. A crowd gathered and someone, presumably the chief's son, stabbed Friesleven with a spear. After that happened, the village's population disappeared and the ship left for fear of attack before there was any attempt to save the captain. Marlowe arrived in Brussels, Belgium, where he traveled to the main office for the trade company. There he signed the necessary paperwork to join with the company, and as he was leaving, one of the secretaries said to him, Mori Tori te salutant, or Hail, they who are about to die salute you. He reaches Africa on a French steamboat, which stopped at many French colonies. At each there was reports of death and men dying daily. As they continue to his destination, they pass a man of war, which is firing endlessly into the brush. He disembarks at the Belgian colony in Boma, where he has yet another 200 miles upriver to go to his awaiting ship. He gets onto another steamer and sails up river until he reaches Matadi. Here he sees a group of Africans chained together with neck collars being marched down the road. Later he feels both disgust and pity for a group of natives waiting under a tree to die. They are clearly starved and sick but show no willingness or want to fight. After reaching the camp he finds an elegantly dressed man who is the company's chief accountant. Speaking to the accountant, he learns of Mr. Kurtz, who is in charge of a trading post which sends more ivory than all other camps combined. He then sets out for the final leg to his ship, a 20-mile hike. When he reaches the camp, he meets the manager and his servant boy, an overfed child from the coast. Speaking with the manager, Marlowe learns that the boat he has journeyed so long to reach is sunk just offshore and is in need of repairs before it will be seaworthy again. One evening, a grass shed bursts into flames. During the fire, he speaks to a brickmaker who tells him that Kurtz will become the assistant manager of the central station in one year, and perhaps even higher in two. After thinking about Kurtz, Marlowe begins corresponding with him to get good rivets to fix his ship. 
He also befriends a foreman in the camp, and they begin working on the repairs with great enthusiasm, confident that the rivets will arrive. Instead of rivets, a group of men show up in five separate caravans and set up a trading post, but the men are all very secretive. After his boat is repaired, Marlow begins his journey upriver to find Kurtz. He would travel for hours and feel as though the landscape never changed. On his ship he had a group of cannibals who would chop wood at night to burn in the boiler. He also had two natives, one working with the boiler to make sure it had enough fire, and the second at the helm, following Marlow's directions through the water. On board were also the manager and a group of pilgrims. One day they came across a small house on the bank of the river, and they stopped to investigate. There was a piece of wood, and on it was written, Wood for you. Hurry up. Approach cautiously. There was also an old book, an inquiry into some points of seamanship. Marlow took the book, and they continued on. A thick fog rolled in, and the ship was anchored. From the land they could hear war cries, and thought the boat was about to come under attack. After two hours of waiting, the fog passed and the ship remained safe. Plotting that they were only about a mile and a half from Kurt's camp, they continued on. Shortly before reaching the camp, they were attacked by natives on shore with bows and arrows. They fired back at them with guns, but the native manning the helm was pierced by a spear and died. Marlow realizes that Kurtz is presumably dead as well. This thought crushes him as he realized the last few months his ultimate goal was to talk to Kurtz. After they reach the camp, Marlow is greeted by a Russian man who turns out to be the owner of the book he found in the house. The Russian tells Marlow that the attack by the natives was because they do not want Kurtz to leave. The Russian goes on to explain how Kurtz would often go into the jungle for days on his own and come back with entire tribes who would bring him ivory. The natives both respected and feared Kurtz. Around the camp he had placed poles with heads on top of rebels that Kurtz himself had killed, which showed the natives that Kurtz was willing to kill if he needed or wanted to. While they are talking, some natives appear from the jungle carrying Kurtz on a stretcher. He is sick, suffering from starvation, and has withered. Despite this, his voice was grave, profound, and vibrating, while the man did not seem capable of a whisper. Kurtz is carried into his home as Marlow watches, and an African woman comes out of the jungle and approaches the boat. She stands staring at the men for a minute, throws her hands up as though she were grabbing the sky, and then walks off. Talking to the Russian Moor, Marlow learns that Kurtz himself had ordered the attack on the boat because he did not want to leave the camp or the natives. That night, just outside the camp, Marlow intercepts Kurtz, who is trying to get to a group of natives holding a vigil just over the edge of the jungle. Marlow persuades Kurtz to come with him and carries him to the boat, setting him on the couch in the pilot house. In the morning, as the boat leaves with Kurtz, all the natives gather at the shore, both sad and angry that Kurtz is gone. As they continue down the river to the central camp, Kurtz's condition worsens, and eventually, as expected, the ship breaks down. While Marlow is making repairs to the ship, Kurtz dies, but not until he has given Marlow a small bundle of papers to keep safe. The next day, the pilgrims on the boat bury Kurtz, and then the ship continues on to the central camp. After returning to Europe, Marlow is approached by several people claiming to know Kurtz and require all the documents he had with him at his time of death. Marlow refuses to give these papers up until he finds Kurtz's fiance. He meets her, and she is still mourning the loss of Kurtz despite him having died a year prior. Marlow gives her the papers, some love letters, and she asks him what Kurt's last words were. Though in his head, Marlow could hear Kurt saying, The horror, the horror. He tells her Kurt's last words were her name. 